From the patient files of Dr. William Wickman, director of Hillbrook Insane Asylum. Patient 649, Samuel Santini, aka Flatface. Yes, I'm here doing my job as usual, despite recent revelations. I'm sure you've heard of it by now. A group, no, a cult, claims to have infiltrated our beloved institution. The silent, they call themselves. Bleeding heart fanatics, concerned with the treatment of the patients here. Can you believe that? They're actually concerned with these homicidal monsters. I'd like to see that leader of theirs, that coward who hides behind a goofy mask, spend a minute or two in a company of patients 502 or 797. Or 649 here for that matter. I'm sure he'd eat up his own words after that. Just this morning 649 caved in the skull of yet another guard. That's four so far, plus two nurses. And I told them all not to look at his face for more than one second. These people never seem to listen. Isn't that right, Dr. Quartermain? Anyway, these silent fools are nothing to be too concerned about. We've had similar situations in the past. Protesters, organizations trying to get us shut down, they never succeed. Nothing can ever break Hillbrook. And like I said, I won't let these events distract me in the slightest. I'm here to do my job as usual. And I've got a real doozy of a patient for you this time. I feel this tale is actually told best through the eyes of one John Carbone, or Johnny as his friends called him. Johnny was a small-time punk, a failed criminal who tried his very best to become a so-called big shot. He ran with a mob led by his friend Vincent Marcelli, another pathetic loser, ranking only slightly higher than Johnny on the criminal totem pole. Together with his crew, Johnny robbed houses, sold low-grade dope, fixed a few local boxing matches and pulled off a number of other minor offenses. Johnny simply lacked the brains, the guts, the charisma and the right connections to ever rise higher in the underworld. He might also have had too much of a conscience, something which in his line of work one should lack. Then came the day when his girlfriend, an equally failed specimen of a human being, informed Johnny that he was to be a father. Little Missy was born some months later. Don't look at me, I didn't name her. When Johnny looked into those big, innocent, bright blue eyes for the very first time, he knew immediately that he had to change. His old life was over, and he had to become a decent human being. He had to do it for Missy. So Johnny did just that. He said goodbye to his crew, moved to a slightly less horrible neighborhood, and got himself a real job. For seven years, the three of them lived a fairly happy existence, until Missy's mother died in a car crash. Now it was just him and Missy. Taking care of a child all on his own was obviously much more challenging, but somehow Johnny may do, just barely. But by the time Missy had turned 10, came the second shock. Missy was diagnosed with a serious illness, a very fatal one. With a grave voice, the doctor told Johnny his little daughter only had two months left to live. Unless they performed an operation on her. The illness was treatable, if they did it now, within the next few weeks. Of course, to Johnny's dismay, the treatment came with a price. A literal price. It wasn't free, but rather cost a fairly large sum of money. A large sum for a loser like Johnny, that is. His honest job paid even less than his earlier failed criminal escapades had done. He knew that his grouchy boss wouldn't give him any advances. And besides, that wouldn't cover the expenses of the operation anyway. No, his salary alone wouldn't do it. He needed cash, lots of it, and he needed it quick. Damn quick. Desperate and short out of other options, Johnny saw no other way out but calling his old buddy Vincent Marcelli. Marcelli wasn't exactly happy to hear from his former associates. He'd left them high and dry after all, abandoning them from out of nowhere. Still, he knew the reasons behind it, and therefore accepted it. Marcelli may have been a cheap hood and a thief, but he wasn't a monster. When he now heard Johnny's sob story, how little Missy, just 10 years old, was dying, he was almost moved to tears. Marcelli was real sorry though. There was nothing he could do for Johnny. No cash to lend. His business was even slower than it used to be. The police had lately been cracking down hard on the Marcelli gang, leaving very little of their already meager operations standing intact. Johnny had suspected this though. He wasn't really calling to ask for a handout. He was calling to ask for a job. Marcelli himself obviously had no jobs to offer, but he knew the underworld like his own underwear. If anything was going on in the city, he would know. He would know if any jobs were being pulled, by whom and if they needed another man. Marcelli contemplated the question, then told Johnny to meet him at a specific time and place in two days. He said it in code, of course, a code only members of their old gang would understand. Odds were the cops had the line bugged. 
Two days later, the two old friends did indeed meet. It was in a shabby, rundown bar in the old neighborhood, a place they'd frequented together in the past. After a brief visit down memory lane shared over a beer, Marcelli gave Johnny the scoop. Lots of jobs were being pulled, all over town, but most of them were too big for Johnny. Here he was, a has-been, and frankly a never was, coming from out of nowhere after a decade out of the loop, asking for unspecified work. Marcelli was scratching his head. Johnny could understand his predicament, but he reminded him of Missy, even showed a photo of her. Then he asked, you said most of these jobs are too big, so what about the other ones? Marcelli leaned back in his chair and began to muse the thoughts. He then leaned forwards again and started to whisper. He started to whisper about a jewelry heist plan for next week. It was a small, newly opened jewelry shop on the other side of town. Nothing too fancy. All in all, valuing at maybe half a million. Rings, swatches, bracelets. With the right connection, easily fenced. Apparently, the right connection was in place. A guy known as Mr. Goldberg was behind the caper. A very well-connected guy. He wasn't going to participate in the caper himself, though. He had hired a crew for that. And that's where Johnny came in. Or could potentially come in. You see, the crew was a man short. Apparently, one of them had got gotten booked on a rape charge at the last minute. It was a guy who was supposed to keep the shop's owners in check while two of the others raided the displays and the fourth guy waited outside in a getaway car. The shop owners were apparently an elderly man and his 30-something son. Just stand there for 10 minutes, putting a gun in their faces, while the others swiped all the sparkles. Then get out. And for that, get paid $50,000 by Mr. Goldberg. That was the pay, 50 k for each of them. $50,000. To Johnny, that was a fortune, and well enough to cover Missy's operation. He was in. He was so in. Marcelli was a bit weary though. Apparently the crew hired for the job was led by a guy named Sam Santini, aka Flatface. This Flatface was known to be a pretty dangerous guy, not the type you really wanted to socialize with. It didn't matter to Johnny though, he needed that money. Fine, Marcelli said, promising he'd set it all up. The next day, Johnny got a call from Marcelli, who told him where and when to go, again in code. He was to meet up with Santini and his boys, Frankie and Sal, at a restaurant the following evening. There, they'd go over the plan. Before Marcelli hung up, he gave his friend a warning in a very grave tone. Whatever you do, don't ever call Santini flatface, and avoid staring at him. In fact, don't ever look at him for more than one second. Seemed strange, but before Johnny could probe any further, Marcelli hung up. The following evening then came. Johnny threw on the only suit he owned and went to the meet. It did not feel good in the slightest, getting back into the game, but there was no other choice. The restaurant was a shady one to say the least, the type that solely existed for these types of meetings. The food was merely an afterthought. As Johnny entered, he noticed three guys sitting in a booth in the far back of the place. One of them was faced his way, while the others sat on the other side of the booth, their backs turned to him. His party, he assumed. Besides them, almost no one else was in there. There were two sinister looking guys sitting at the other end of the place. They were whispering to each other, and looked suspiciously at Johnny as he entered. He then began to walk towards his party, and the two paid him no further attention. As he came up to the booth with the three guys, one of them, the one facing his way, asked, You Johnny? Yeah, he replied. The guy then moved over, leaving room for Johnny to sit down. And so he did. As he did, he was faced with the other two. The one there was nothing special with. But the other guy, the one sitting in the other seat, right in front of Johnny, well, he simply must have been flat face. Johnny immediately knew why people called him that, and why some felt inclined to stare at him. His nose was completely broken, basically smashed in, like an old boxer, but worse than Johnny had ever seen before, and he'd seen his fair share of boxers. There was no nose bridge left whatsoever. This, combined with the fact Santini had very thin lips, almost no jaw, and a wide and pretty steep forehead, gave off the impression that his entire face had been flattened. Flattened with an iron, like in a cartoon. It was especially noticeable when Santini turned in profile. Johnny had to struggle not to stare and to not snicker. Santini was wearing a stylish black pinstriped suit and a flashy purple satin tie and hanky. Johnny got the impression the outfit was meant to draw away attention from his face. But yeah, it didn't exactly work. 
Santini hadn't even looked up at their new friend. He was too busy chewing on a big steak. The other two, Frankie and Sal, weren't eating anything. They were just drinking beers. A fat, middle-aged waiter then came up to the booth, asking what Johnny was having. He looked at Frankie and Sal's glasses and said beer. There was no way he could actually eat anything. He was so nervous he would have puked it up immediately. A nice cool beer to settle the nerves though, that was just a ticket. No one at the table said anything. No small talk, no nothing. The only sound heard was flat faces chewing. Frankie and Sal had stern faces and looked like hardened killers. Meanwhile, Johnny himself had never murdered anyone. He'd given a guy or two a real good beating, sure, but never actually killed anyone. Of course, Marcelli hadn't mentioned this to Mr. Goldberg. After all, this particular job required someone willing to shoot an old man and his son in case they acted up. After 15 minutes of dead silence, Santini finally finished his steak. He didn't say anything to Johnny, he didn't greet him or introduce himself. Instead, he immediately began to go over the plan. He produced a piece of paper from his inner jacket pocket. A piece of paper with the layout of the jewelry shop drawn on it. Drawn by Mr. Goldberg, Johnny assumed. Santini folded out the paper on the table, pointing at the various marked spots. The front door, the cash register, the various displays. He told each man where to go, when to do it and what to do once there. Santini himself and Frankie were to collect all the jewelry from the displays, while Sal was the getaway driver. Johnny was of course responsible for the owners, and was to enter first, smack one of them in the face with the butt of his gun and then force them to the back of the store. This would all take place at 7.50 in the evening. The place closed at 8. At that hour there would be a minimum of customers, probably no customers, or so Mr. Goldberg claimed. But in case there were customers, they would simply be added to Johnny's work chore. By 8, they would all be gone. 10 minutes tops, that's all it could take. While Santini was going over all of this, he constantly kept looking all around him. He especially kept turning to peek at the two other guys on the other end of the restaurant. He was paranoid over something, but Johnny didn't know what. Did he really think anyone was eavesdropping in this place? With all those turns of his head, Johnny got numerous glimpses of Santini's humorous profile. He had to bite down on his lower lip to suppress laughter. He hoped no one noticed. When they were all done, Flatface folded a piece of paper with the layout on it and placed it snugly back into his pocket. He then signaled for the fat waiter to come with the check. Apparently Flatface was paying for all of their orders. That was decent enough of him, Johnny thought. So far he didn't seem like such a terrible guy, just weird. As the waiter delivered the check and Johnny was just about to get up and leave, Santini said something. What are you looking at? Johnny froze. He was confused. He at first thought Santini was talking to him, but then he realized the question was directed at the waiter. The waiter looked confused too and just said, what? Nothing. Santini insisted though. The waiter had looked at something. He'd stared at his face. He'd stared at his face and grinned. The waiter denied the accusation, repeating he hadn't looked at anything. Santini wouldn't have it though. His voice got louder, more upset. He yelled out that the waiter had stared at his face. He then turned to look at Johnny and the boys, his eyes full of rage. Johnny looked away and assumed the boys did too. Santini explained to them how this lowlife waiter had been standing there, staring at his face and laughing. The boys didn't say anything, neither did Johnny. Frankly, Johnny had no clue if the waiter had looked at Santini's face or not. Maybe for a few seconds, that was possible he supposed, but he couldn't possibly have been standing there staring and laughing. Santini then got up from his seat. He stood for a few seconds, looking the waiter up and down. Meanwhile, the waiter had adverted his gaze entirely and instead looked at Johnny with pleading eyes. Apparently, he was familiar with Flatface. Don't look at him for more than a second, like Marcelli had said. So this is what it meant. Then, from out of nowhere, Flatface slammed his steep forehead into the waiter's face, giving him a shattering headbutt. The waiter instantly went tumbling down, his face covered in blood. Santini wasn't satisfied though. He followed the waiter down to the floor, starting a barrage of vicious headbutts intercut with punches aimed at the guy's head. The two guys at the other end of the restaurant looked on in curiosity. A younger, more fit guy wearing an apron appeared from the kitchen door, cocking a shotgun. Frankie and Sal immediately jumped up from the booth, shoving Johnny aside and drew pistols from their jackets. They pointed them straight at the guy, forcing him to drop the shotgun. Meanwhile, Santini still went at it, ignoring anything else that was happening around him. Johnny had seen plenty of violence in his life. 
gunshots, stab wounds, black eyes, broken noses. But this, this was something else. It was sickening. Santini was literally turning the poor guy's entire head into nothing but mush. And he just wouldn't stop. He kept on repeatedly slamming his fists and forehead in what was now nothing more but brain matter and puddles of blood. Johnny felt like passing out. Suddenly there was nothing funny about Flatface any longer. Eventually he did stop pummeling the long dead corpse, and all of them then left the place in a hurry. Frankie and Sal went with a completely blood soaked Santini, most of it belonging to the waiter of course, while Johnny went his own way, back home to Missy. The only thing he could think of was to naturally get the hell out of this deal. Flatface was fucking insane. He'd get them all killed, or at the very least arrested. And there'd be no money. No money for the operation. During those last moments of her short life, Missy would be all alone too. There was simply no way he could go through with it. He had to get the money some other way. Call Marcelli again, tell him to find something else. There must be something, anything. And so he did. Later that very evening, he called his old friend and told him the entire story. The restaurant, Santini, the waiter, the blood, the madness. Marcelli didn't seem too surprised. Well, he had warned Johnny about Flatface after all. However, he had no other jobs to offer. Nobody else was willing to take Johnny on. This job, the jewelry heist, was it. Marcelli asked if he should call Mr. Goldberg and tell him he was backing out. Johnny was quiet for a while, a million thoughts and concerns racing through his mind. Then, he reluctantly whispered, No, I'm in. At 7.49, the four of them drove up to the jewelry shop. At 7.50, three of them waltzed into the shop. One of the owners, the son, walked up to greet them, but stopped dead in his tracks when he noticed their masks. All three of them were wearing black bandanas, covering up the lower parts of their faces. Before the young man could even open his mouth, Johnny buttoned up his coat and produced a sawed-off shotgun. With the butt of the shotgun, he knocked the guy right in the face, sending him staggering backwards. He then aimed the weapon at the old man standing by the cast register, and commanded them to move forward and join his son. He did without any hesitation, panic in his eyes and sweat pouring down his forehead. The son was bleeding from his nose and his nervous father pulled out a hanky to stop it. Johnny forced them further back into the shop. Santini and Frankie saw this as their cue and with small billy clubs began smashing the displays, quickly swiping up all the sparkly and tossing it into bags. So far everything was going as planned. Still, Johnny couldn't help but worrying. He found it amusing how nervous the father looked because he was feeling exactly the same. A good thing he was wearing a mask, as otherwise they would have seen how his lip was shaking. His shotgun was shaking a bit too, and he hoped they were too shook up to notice. He removed a finger from the triggers, afraid he'd otherwise blow the pair away on accident. The shotgun had been supplied to him by Flatface in the car drive over there. It was ideal for this type of job, he had said. Small and compact, yet far more intimidating than a pistol. The other three were carrying pistols, in their coat pockets, just in in case the police showed up. Johnny then noticed how the father was staring at Santini while he violently smashed his play glasses. Staring at Santini. What if he looked over here to see how things were going and spotted the old guy oogling him? Sure, he was wearing a mask, so no funny face to laugh at, but Johnny doubted that mattered to Flatface. He was crazy. He thought everyone was looking at him and laughing. To make matters worse, Santini then moved closer, going for a display right behind Johnny. The old man was still staring at him. Johnny felt like he was going to pass out. Stop staring, you damn asshole, he muttered quietly on under his mask without anyone hearing. But the geezer just wouldn't. So, desperate to save the situation, the sweaty Johnny shoved a shotgun right in the old man's face to divert his attention. And it worked. He was no longer staring at Santini. He was now staring down two barrels, just an inch away from his face. However, the son then began to act up, trying to shove himself in front of his dad and heroically protect him. Now almost panicking, Johnny saw no other way out but smacking the son in the face again. This time he did it fairly lightly though, but still enough to gain the desired effect. Once once again, the father was busy stopping his son's nosebleed, too preoccupied to glance at Flatface. Thank God, Johnny whispered. Any problems? Santini then barked from right behind him. No, no problems here, everything is under control, Johnny quickly replied. Five minutes had passed since it all began. The longest five minutes in Johnny's life. 
Four tense minutes later, Anola Sparkly had been collected. Santini and Frankie then calmly exited the shop, threw the bags of jewels into the car and got in themselves. Meanwhile, Johnny slowly backed out of the shop, his shotgun aimed firmly at the two owners. Not until he was out did he relax the weapon and turn around. He quickly joined the others in the car and a few seconds later, they were gone. An hour later, as they were waiting for Mr. Goldberg at the meet, an abandoned warehouse by the docks, Johnny simply could not believe that everything had gone so smoothly. Well, smoothly might have been a bit of an overstatement. It did go well though. He'd expected the very worst. Santini slaughtering everyone in the shop. A firefight with the cops. He was ecstatic and could barely conceal it from the others. Those 50k, they were soon his, and Missy would soon be cured and well again. Johnny was so pleased he almost forgot not to stare at Flatface. Now that would have been really stupid, if he'd messed it up now, in such a silly way. After they'd waited for about 15 minutes, Mr. Goldberg finally showed up. Sal kept lookout and spotted him pulling up in his car. After parking next to theirs, Mr. Goldberg, with four muscle guys in tow, then entered the warehouse, briefcase in hand. Johnny knew what was in that briefcase, and he nearly began to salivate at the mouth thinking about it. Santini and Frankie approached the newly arrived party, their arms full of bags with jewels. They handed over the bags to two of the muscle guys, who each opened up one of them. Both showed the contents to Mr. Goldberg, who looked pleased. He then handed over the briefcase to Santini, casting him a quick glance and a satisfied smile, then averting his gaze. That was it, Johnny thought. It was all over now. The money, that sweet money, was theirs. And they could all go home. He'd go home to Missy and bring her terrific news. What are you smiling at? Flatfaced and barked at Mr. Goldberg. Johnny felt a rock sink in his stomach. No, he thought. Flatface wasn't that insane. He wouldn't do anything to Mr. Santini then slammed his flat face right into Mr. Goldberg's. Now, Mr. Goldberg was a pretty small and scrawny guy, so when Santini rammed him with that vicious headbutt, it looked as if he died instantly. His eyes went blank and his body completely limp. He fell to the grimy warehouse floor like a weightless ragdoll, folding in on himself. Santini naturally followed him down, despite the fact Goldberg appeared to be deceased already, and once again started a thunderstorm of continuous headbutts and punches, cracking the little guy's skull open like a melon. Meanwhile, the four muscle men had drawn pistols and opened fire upon the entire Santini crew. Frankie and Sal went down immediately, blood splattering from their torsos, while Johnny just stood there, dumbstruck, not understanding what the hell had just happened. They were done, in the clear, the money was theirs and it had all been over. He refused to accept that this was happening. The job was done, the money his, and Missy had her cure. He then felt several bullets fill up his torso, his chest, his shoulders his stomach, and soon Johnny didn't feel anything. Santini himself was the last man to go down. He wasn't the last man to get shot, he just simply held out the longest, refusing to end his pummeling of Mr. Goldberg's lifeless form until he was so full of holes it felt like all air had left him. The savage flat face was indeed deflated like a balloon in the end. Thinking everyone was dead at the scene, the four muscle men grabbed all the jewels, the money and Mr. Goldberg's unrecognizable corpse, threw it all into the trunk of their car and drove away. Everyone wasn't dead though, not quite. One Sam Santini still breathed, if ever so faintly. Thanks to some good Samaritan calling the police after hearing all that gunfire, an ambulance made sure he got the medical care he needed to survive. Pretty amazing, the surgeon dug out 20 slugs from his riddle body. Sam Flatface Santini was then incarcerated at Blackburn Penitentiary, a place he was already well familiar with. He had a rap sheet longer than the red carpet, stretching back to his early teens. Muggings, assault, murder, theft, disorderly behavior, concealment of a deadly weapon, he'd done it all. Santini's irrational and violent behavior just seemed to get worse over time, and this time the warden at Blackburn felt prison probably wasn't the right place for such a maniac. Thus, on the recommendation of the warden himself, Santini was sent here instead. And how thankful we are. In case you were wondering what happened to little Missy, well, with no money, you can figure it out. 
The amusing part of all of this is, of course, that the silent probably regards patient 649 as an innocent victim, a poor misunderstood lost soul. All he needs is someone to hug him and say that they love him. Well, silent, you'll get that opportunity. As soon as we catch one of you, I'll have you committed here at Hillbrook. No trial, no jury, I'll just lock you up myself in the same cell as 649.